Welcome to the HEAL Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorris, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. And I've discovered on my journey that so much more is possible than we can begin to imagine. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Heal Podcast. Um, Today, I'm very excited about this episode. I have lots of questions. We have David, Dr. David Rabin. We were just talking about the correct way to say his name. Dr. David Rabin, MD and PhD. He's a neuroscientist, a board-certified psychiatrist, health tech entrepreneur, and inventor who has been studying the impact of chronic stress in humans for more than a decade. He is co-founder and chief medical officer at Apollo Neuroscience, which has developed the first scientifically validated wearable technology that actively improves energy, focus, and relaxation using a novel touch therapy that signals safety to the brain. We're also going to talk about psychedelics because he is on the forefront and very qualified to talk about psychedelic assisted therapies, which so all of those things. I mean, there's so much to talk about. So welcome, Dr. David. Thanks so much for having me, Kelly. Yeah. Um, I don't know where to start because there's so much to cover and, and we're going to do it in an hour. But I guess um, talk a little bit about just for your background, like what got you interested in psychiatry and then specifically psychedelics? So uh, as, a, as a child, it really started quite young. I was maybe four or five, six years old, and I just had very vivid dreams as a kid. Now as an adult, I know lots of other people who had this too, but as a kid, um, you know, you don't really talk about this kind of stuff, so I would just have these very intense dreams that felt very real, and usually they weren't nightmares. They were, you know, me hanging out with people that I knew in my life, my brothers or my friends, Uh, and occasionally they were nightmares, but they felt to me at that time basically as real as real life and so uh, as i got older i started to ask my you know my parents what what's going on when we're sleeping and what are these dreams that we're having and what do they mean and and you know my parents like many parents i think were just trying to calm me down help me sleep through the night and so they said you know don't worry about it dreams aren't real uh and yet i kept having them and they kept feeling real and so even from a very young age you know this is again like the under 10 years old, I was starting to think, you know, maybe the adults don't know what the word real means because this certainly feels different, you know, and and I can't tell the difference uh, at the time. And so uh, I started to get really interested in consciousness and the way that we use words to describe reality and uh, this waking life versus our sleeping life. And so dreams became very interesting to me. And I guess as I started to progress through my journey of education, I really wanted to study dreams and I realized and consciousness and the way we think and feel and make meaning of the world. And I found out to my uh, dismay that this was an extremely hard field to study. And it was something that was very challenging to make a living at uh, at the time. And so I ended up actually going into studying chronic stress and resilience and um, sort of how we make meaning of stress and how stress challenges some of us to grow and become our best selves, like some of the greatest minds and and athletes and people we look up to in the world like michael jordan and these other folks who are my idols as a child and then same right life-size poster at the end of my hall right i was in love and 23 then, is part of all my passwords still yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's a it was a real thing real truly inspirational yeah. right um and like pushing the real boundaries of human performance and then on the other hand i was seeing people with mental illness and aging disorders who were suffering from severe chronic stress completely decompensate and fall apart And uh, it was always interesting to me, why do people go in one direction or the other? And so that actually was most of my early studies and and training in neuroscience and medicine. And then in 2012, um, I was treating a lot of folks with treatment-resistant mental illness, a lot of PTSD, depression, anxiety, and people who just weren't getting better with the treatments we were taught to deliver, which is disappointing for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And one of my good friends, Uh, who always knew she wanted to become a psychiatrist said, you know, Dave, you should really consider becoming a psychiatrist because it's the field for you and you'd be so good at it. And I was like, "Eh, I don't know. You know, psychiatry at that time was one of the most 
uh, looked down upon fields in medicine. A lot of it was thought of as guesswork and we couldn't cure anything and we just treat people for life with medicines and that seemed kind of discouraging. And then she sent me 10 of the leading psychedelic therapy publications that had come out in the last few years. And I stayed up all night reading these papers and within a day, 24 hours, I realized that this was the field for me. It was finally the opportunity to seeing these, you know, world round scientists publishing in top tier journals that were respected, that you could, you know, understand consciousness, dreams, meaning making, the way we feel, uh, and all these things that I was talking about earlier that I was interested in by studying the impact of psychedelics on humans. And so uh, that kind of led me down that path and, and to my area of specialty, which is effectively trauma and addiction and altered states of consciousness. That is so wild. I just love how life <clears throat> brings you around full circle and, you know, at the right time in the right place. And, um, and you can't necessarily predict how it's going to go, right? <laughs> yeah. And you just go with flow. Like, you, or, or you had a knowing when you were a child that to question reality and what our perception of reality is. Mm -hmm. Like, that's pretty profound as a 10 year old or sub 10 year old. Um, and then you came along this path and entered into this field where you're literally tapping into alter states of reality and expanded consciousness and, you know, activating that dream state. And I mean, I'm just, it's so cool. Um, so I'm well, thinking. well, and what's so interesting about, about these states we're accessing when we're in dreams or when we're in psychedelic, uh, influence state, psychedelic medicine influence states is that they have a lot of meaning to them that in a lot of cases is more real than our waking life right we we see this with our patients all the time who have severe mental illness who see the world in a specific way that is i'm a victim i have this illness forever i'm never going to heal i'm never going to recover because that's what they were taught and then all of a sudden they have this moment of insight where under the influence of a psychedelic medicine like ketamine or MDMA in the proper therapeutic setting of safety with the right trained therapist mm -hmm. that they realize, oh, wait, I actually do have the ability to feel different because this feeling is familiar to me and it reminds me of the way I felt as a child before I knew about all the mm -hmm. craziness of the world, mm -hmm. right? And that feeling of familiarity helps people remember that that maybe there is a different way to see the world, right? Yeah. There is a different, there, maybe there's another truth out there that I've been missing yeah. because I haven't been aware of it. And then we start to work on that and it just changes people's so lives. It's like a reassociation from a disassociation. Exactly. Right? Or remembering. Yeah. Um, and that's like, you know, when we talk about, and you and I could talk about divinity and consciousness and like coming into this meat suit or <laughs> being a human and then being separated. So it's this illusion of separation, but we're all, connected and, mm -hmm. and it's that the people that have these great awakenings and we've had you know taste of it you probably much more than me is it's really just remembering having that association of like oh i remember when i was ex an expansive soul without this limited body and mm -hmm. neurology that's mm -hmm. like you know um so be to before we go into the psychedelics i'd love to just because what I'm seeing is that, you know, in modern society, we have all these beautiful conveniences, but those conveniences are killing us. <clears throat> and, and without judgment, I would like just a little education and background on like what psych, you know, for anxiety, depression, all of these things that are going through the roof, OCD and kids, which is an anxiety disorder, um, you know, we treat them with SSRIs most of the time. I would love to just give for people listening, like what is actually happening when you take an SSRI? Um, just so people are aware of like, you know, for that mm -hmm. short term gain, what the long term loss is or for sure. And obviously there's a population that is ripe for. So I'd like to know who you think that is as well, knowing that there's a psychedelic aspect too. Um, but just lay that foundation and then we can kind of contrast it with psychedelics. What they're sure. Doing. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Uh, so I think that when people come into the clinic already experiencing symptoms of a mental illness so they're basically at a point where their day-to-day -day functioning starts to be a struggle they're struggling in relationships with their friends family co-workers uh, losing passion feelings of burnout you know overwhelming anxiety right these are all common in deep poor sleep irritability right these are all common with many different mental illnesses and 
those folks who already are kind of manifesting all those symptoms are out of balance. Their nervous system is, at least from the latest neuroscience evidence that we can tell, their nervous system is in a constant fight or flight state where they're always looking over their shoulder for the next threat. And it's really, really hard to allow your body to heal and recover cognitively, mentally, or physically when our bodies perceive threat in the environment because the way we evolved as animals, not just humans, but literally all animals going back to probably ancient sea snails like 300 million years ago, which is what Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for discovering in 2000, is that we all remember fear and safety in the same way and it stores in our nervous system. And so when we're constantly under threat, we end up with this imbalance in our nervous system where we feel like we are not safe and therefore our bodies interpret that feeling as not being safe, which in modern day society is not predators or lack of air, water, food usually. It's too many emails or too much traffic or too many responsibilities. None of likes. Yeah. Right, not enough <laughs> likes. Yeah, people saying, you know, nasty things about you on socials or it's all of the all of the above mm. and you know, it, it creates this imbalance in our bodies and in our minds that can persist over time if we don't do anything about it. And so what SSRIs and the uh, like Prozac, Zoloft, and which are the most common antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications we use in Western psychiatry are very helpful for is stabilizing those folks for a certain amount of time. Uh, however, they don't result in a cure because the way that they work is they, uh, they flood the serotonin receptors, all of them, with serotonin, which is helpful for... Uh, decreasing the amount of, and this is something that was actually discovered through psychedelic research, but mm. so it's really kind of the modern, the modern theory of how this works is that a lot of, some of these serotonin receptors are critical for meaning making. And so when you flood them, they get oversaturated and then they, you, you get less meaning from negative experiences. Mm. Does that make sense? Yep. The problem is that they're that the SSRIs are non-specific, and the receptors do both positive meaning and negative meaning, and so unpleasantness and joy, mean, meaningfulness from joyful experiences. So when you when you flood that receptor site over time with too, with so much serotonin, the body actually and the mind loses sensitivity to both unpleasant, negative, mm -hmm. disruptive emotions and experiences and positive experiences. And so while these medicines are great for stabilization of folks who are really struggling, and then when combined with psychotherapy, we can see great strides with people. Uh, when used alone, uh, they and for extended periods, they have side effects of numbness, emotional numbness, dulling of sensation. And then, you know, some of the worst side effects people talk about that we're hearing about more commonly now are like sexual dysfunction, where people lose the ability to access peak states of, of sexual... Uh, joy like climax mm -hmm. so that's a real problem all the good things that make it good to be human right and if you're so you know for it's it's very useful to have those tools to stabilize people for short amounts of time yeah. but when we start to forget that we want to use them for a short amount of time and then use the therapy and the other tools we have to eventually get people off of them so that they can do it on their own build more resilience and build more resilience on their own then people wind up taking the medications for a long time and they wind up having more of these long-term side effects, and which include lack of joy or decreased joy. Joy is one of the most healing things that we have access mm -hmm. to, right? And including sexual joy, which mm -hmm. is something that we were all born to experience. So, so that's the kind of the double-edged sword of of SSRIs right. that we see now a lot in Western society. Which the benefits outweigh when you need to stabilize and you need to numb the actual just pain and right. terror of whatever is keeping you in that fight or flight. But long term, you're also going to cut off all the things that make life pleasurable and right. access to that. So, And maybe not all the things, but enough of them that it can make people not want to continue taking the medicine. Mm. And so that's why we focus so much on medication plus therapy is really the goal. Because if we can help you feel safe enough and calm enough in your own body where you start to feel, okay, you're not constantly overwhelmed by negative thoughts and emotions. You can kind of be, feel a little more even and in control, even for you know several months, that's enough time for us to teach you some of the therapy techniques mm -hmm. that you can do your own self-work. But if we just give you the medicine, then people just become dependent on the medicine and they think that, oh, well, I need to take this medicine to heal myself. Mm -hmm. And then that externalizes 
the source of the healing, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what we teach, net, what we teach in psychology, uh, similar to what was taught in ancient tribal Western and Eastern medicine, is the source of healing always comes from within the person seeking to be healed. Mm -hmm. So if we are, if we as the doctors are not ex conveying that critical point to the patient or the client they're going to think it's the medicine they're putting in their bodies that's essential for their healing. Right. Which is a slippery slope, mm -hmm. right? It literally gives your healing power away to the medicine or the medicines that you were told to take. So there's a lot that we can learn from how we've done things in the past and what we now know works well to kind of optimize these protocols for people, which we do in our practice and a number of other uh, practices around the country. So if someone comes in with, I'm, as I'm sure they do all the time now. I, I probably have been close to calling <laughs> with severe anxiety, depression. Um, I'm, I'm laughing to make light of a very intense world. But, um, I mean, like, is your go-to ketamine right now? Or is, like, I, I'd love to get in at some point. I want to dive into ketamine specifically yeah. because it's, it's, it's the one that's legal and mm -hmm. it's, you know, synthetic. And yeah, it's the only legal psychedelic medicine we have right so, now. So far, right? And um, so I guess we'll start there. And then eventually I want to get to, like, how, how do you know if, like, MDMA or psilocybin or ketamine is right? Like, do you yeah. go on instinct? or So I want to get into the nuances of each of those. Um, but, yeah, ketamine, anesthesia. Yeah, so ketamine is a very interesting molecule because it was discovered for anesthesia and pain relief, physical pain relief, and it was originally used and and pioneered over 70 years ago uh, and originally used with soldiers in battle who were in Vietnam. And the reason why is because it's a dissociative anesthetic that's very safe, and you can administer it with a single injection in the field even, and it uh, dissociates your mind from your body. So if you are if you just got shot and you're bleeding out on the field, if you start getting really worried about what's happening to you in the mm -hmm. moment, you go into shock and your chances of survival decrease by something like 90%. Oh, wow. So when they, now that to this day, they still use ketamine in these emergency military situations wow. to evacuate wounded soldiers from the battlefield. And then following that, it became a very popular surgical anesthetic that was not just used in adults, but pregnant women and children because it was so safe. Oh, wow. And then it became used in animals because animals are very sensitive to anesthesia. And so ketamine is, happens to be one of the most gentle anesthetics. It was discovered in the late 90s, early 2000s to, by somewhat of random chance, have these very powerful antidepressant effects. And um, we don't see that with most anesthetic agents. So there was something different going on with ketamine that made it really interesting from a mental health perspective where you could give somebody a single dose and for a couple of weeks after, they'd be feeling happier and more and lighter and more themselves. And that doesn't happen with our other antidepressants. You know, like Prozac Zoloft, it's like four to eight weeks to take effect. Um, most of our other antidepressants take a long, long time. So, And most anesthesia are like, you've got a detox and there's right. no you know, euphoric effect after. Right, you yeah. Actually, there's actually like... Yeah, opposite. sometimes people feel worse afterwards, yeah. a lot of the time. Um, so this was an unusual observation with ketamine. And then subsequently, it was also found that ketamine has these other interesting properties where there it's actually acutely anti-suicidal. So think about that, right? You have somebody who comes into the ER, uh, they're, you know, feeling like they want to hurt themselves or take their lives. And um, normal in the past, we would have to take these folks and we'd have to hospitalize them for X amount of time until they feel better. And then the medications we're giving them in the hospital take sometimes weeks to work. So we're not even necessarily going to see the benefit during the time they're staying with us. Ketamine has this ability to, with a single dose, reduce, substantially reduce suicidal ideation and tendencies. Uh, and we don't have other drugs like that with, that work in that way with a single dose to be fairly potently anti-suicidal. Uh, so ketamine over the last 20 years has been really heavily pushed into the psychotherapy space where it's used at very low doses compared to what we use in the, in the operating room. Mm. Um, but combined with therapy, it provides fairly profound uh, transformation in people who have depression, PTSD, anxiety, so-so. But we're starting to see early evidence for anxiety treatment as well um, with just, you know, four to 12 doses over 20 weeks. Uh, not every day. 
and it has very very low side effect profile at the doses that we use it at in mental health which is very low mm-hmm. um just on the threshold of psychedelics it's barely there okay um so so it's it's a really exciting medication because you know we can admit it, we can order it now the pharmacy makes it they can send it to your home they can break, send it to the clinic you can do sessions in clinic it's very versatile it only lasts 60 to 90 minutes uh, and it has this very interesting effect of inducing almost like a dreamlike state that helps you to a more organized dreamlike state that helps you f- kind of observe yourself with a quiet mind, mm-hmm. which is what we teach in therapy, but it's really hard to get there. Yeah. So it's a very, very powerful, interesting medicine and has great benefit for depression. And to me, I think with those kinds of things like integration and working through, because I did. Um, profound experience with mushrooms and and when I was like freshman or sophomore mm-hmm. in high school and on the beach Bolsa Chica California <laughs> stars like I literally understood the universe yeah and I was like whoa like it just all it just made sense wake up the next day no retention <laughs> I was like what was it mm-hmm. you know what's that thing I was supposed to learn <laughs> I was like I should have written it down <laughs> um but so with ketamine I mean like ayahuasca psilocybin like things like straight from the earth um i understand that there's this wisdom within the master teacher plants or you know and i kind of just like trust whatever is going to happen and and there's profound insights and like even when people go on like ayahuasca retreats there's maybe some conversation after but it's like a lot of the places there's no integration it's just like what you get you're in a battle and you get Mm -hmm. your you get your info and then you're sent home um ketamine is a you know, it's a, it's just, a, talk to me more about like, do you have to go in with intention? Do you have to ask it? Like, it's just, it's a, how did, how does a synthetic molecule do what it does? Well, well, so LSD is a, re, is a synthetic okay. molecule. It so comes just, from plants, okay. but it is synthetic and it has one, is one of the most powerfully enlightening psychedelic experiences that's ever been described. So I think the, there's a common misunderstanding between synthetic versus natural and whether that matters i think what matters more is what you alluded to earlier which is what are you bringing in right what are you bringing into this experience and what are you trying to get out of it which is the intention and then the process of unpacking what you learn and then integrating it into your day-to-day life Mm -hmm. where it become the new stuff you've learned becomes part of you the new way of seeing the world and seeing yourself become part of you Uh, you start to recognize that maybe thinking yourself as not worthy of love and or as being a worthless person maybe maybe that was something you were taught as a kid by somebody or someone some people but that's not actually true to you anymore and isn't welcome right and you can shed it like a lizard skin and just kind of let it go Mm. uh and so whether you're working with whether we're working with you know at at this point we only pretty much work with ketamine and cannabis because that's all that's legal um but other psychedelic medicines that are synthetic or semi-synthetic tend to have similar benefits when they're combined with that um, preparation for the experience with qualified folks and then support during the experience where you know you're safe for anything that is wants to come up to come mm-hmm. up for, for processing and reflection. And then the integration afterwards where you're continuing to talk to the people that you were working with before, the guides or the therapist, to help you unpack and integrate mm-hmm. all that new knowledge about yourself. And putting language to it then kind of like drops it in deeper to the... Well, the language is how we create, is how we create the long-lasting meaning, yeah. right? Like if the feeling is, is critically important. The feeling of being calm, safe, and present in your body is critically important. But if we don't put words to it, then we don't fully concrete it inside ourselves. And so there, can you do it without words? Yeah, I'm sure you can, but it's harder because we put words to everything else. Mm-hmm. And so the words we use to describe ourselves actually directly impact the way we see ourselves. So if we continue to use the old language to describe ourselves, but we know, but it's, we've had a different feeling and we're still using the old language, then we go back to the old way. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important as part of this therapy process to actually understand, same with SSRIs, what's the new way for you what are you learning? Like, how do you take what you're learning and put it into words and change your narrative and your story to actually reflect the way you know yourself to be? It's like as if there's a tape playing in our brains, all of us, mm-hmm. that 
has been playing on repeat over and over and over again for our whole lives. That's just playing the story of how we were taught to see ourselves in the world. And one of the most common uh, experiences that I get with my patients is on their first experience, they'll be like, wow. I realize I just realized there's a tape playing, right? Like <laughs> yeah. I'm telling myself these stories and they don't have anything to do with how I actually know myself to be. So the next step is, well, did you know you could revise the tape, right? That tape can be edited and, mm. and redone. And they're like, oh, wow, I can revise the tape. And all of a sudden <laughs> they go back and they start rewriting the story, yeah. right? And that's where things actually start to change long term. Yeah. First step is to become aware of the tape. Conscious, exactly. Bring it to the conscious from the subconscious. Yeah. Not just operate through this lens, fish in water. Yeah. Not realizing it. Um, so that, yeah, it just seems like, especially if someone's in like a fight or flight loop for so long because of trauma or whatever, again, that's subconscious. They don't even know. Their baseline is just higher stress and they're always in stress. So they sleep less. They're, you know, right. probably pre diabetic. They're all the yeah, things more that stress does. Yeah. Yeah. All of it. Brain fog, um, more irritable. And just even a series of ketamine can disrupt that so you can get some deep rest and like shock the system, get you back. I mean, do you go, I'm, I assume you go into the parasympathetic when you're afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. Okay. People sometimes do during and sometimes not. Sometimes people get a little amped up during. It depends on the person. But afterwards, people tend to be more just generally kind of calm, mm -hmm. present, more, less, less, co less constant judgment narrative, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize how much time we all spend judging ourselves every moment of every day. Yeah. And when you start to, again, as you said, right, it starts with awareness. You just start to notice, hey, I judge myself a lot. I'm really yeah. hard on myself. Do I need to do that? Is that serving me? Eh, not really. So then you can start to let it go, yeah. right? And that's the, and then practicing that new language, that new way of observing yourself without judgment then helps to retrain those neural pathways to function from a state of greater safety, greater calm, greater clarity, mm -hmm. et cetera, which is all more of a parasympathetic vagal recovery state. Yeah. And I would imagine that we do feel more stressed when we feel more separate. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in these states with ketamine and MDMA and psilocybin, you feel like oneness you feel connected mm -hmm. you f your heart opens and so just that experience is remembering in your biology and then you you know start to walk in the world a little different exactly um and a, and a lot of that i, I mean i you know, don't want to beat a dead horse but to the to, <laughs> to your point a lot of that experience is not just the the medicine it's the medicine amplifying the safety of the therapeutic environment God. So the medicine alone, in some cases, has benefit, but it doesn't have the as reliable and as persistent long-term benefit unless it's combined with the proper therapy. Right. So the therapy, whether you're in an indigenous setting with a tribal culture and they're doing, you know, traditional ayahuasca, the old way where they prepare you before, they do a big circle with everybody, and then you talk about it in a circle afterwards called the integration circle, mm -hmm. or you do that with your doctor, your therapist in the U.S., you're doing the same thing. Yeah. It's just two different takes on, you know, right. how to give people that safe environment to grow within. And then feel seen and heard mm -hmm. and held. Yeah. And yeah, and connected. Yeah. Right. So I heard you mention like what's actually happening in the brain and the, you know, is like a burst. Mm -hmm. um, so I always think like what comes up must go down. So is there any, like I'm like a seeker. So I, I would love to, you know, I, my, you know, ayahuasca, I've done twice and like, you know, different versions after, but like the real drink. And the first time just kicked my ass, was not in the right setting. No one, like no preparation, no being held. It was mm -hmm. just like dark and weird. And I was like, okay, that is not my medicine. Um, but I just went in, I was like, okay, I'm ready. Let's go do it. And yeah. wrong set and setting. Did it later. And it was like so wise and everything I needed. And good on you for trying it again. After yeah, first time. <laughs> I swore I never would. And then you know, our, we our memory fades. <laughs> Two years later, um, right set and setting, and and just I, I had this like preparation going into it, so I knew I knew the journey, I knew what to expect, I knew the questions to ask, mm -hmm. and it was like boom. And I did it all in one night and got what I needed. And I, and it also exp she explained and tied back that first experience. So it all made sense. And there was not much like 
there was no integration after, but but it was very crystal clear, like mm. the insights and like what, because I had that roadmap of what to ask. It was mm. almost like integration during. Um, all of that to say, like I'm a, like I, there's always layers to unpeel mm -hmm. and I want to know myself and I'd love to explore altered states of consciousness, but I also am very reverent of it. So, and That's I'm good. aware that people like, just want to go kind of get, it's a blissful feeling right. to do MDMA or anything else. And so, but I also know that there's too much of a good thing is not good either. So how do we find that balance? Like, and also, sorry, this long winded question, you know, ayahuasca, like sometimes it opens portals and like entities come through or, you know, different shit in different places and, and ketamine, you're in a very safe clinical environment but how how like how important is that how important is the reverence and how do we know what the right dosage or journey is path for us yeah the reverence is critical it's absolutely essential to have respect for these powerful tools you know i think we we've become accustomed to medications just kind of being handed out all the time and very easily and often without a lot of preparation for what to expect. Um, we see this with opiate pain medication, right? And things that are very, very powerful and addictive and have a lot of side effects. And we're, you know, a lot of folks are just not getting the preparation they need for those medications. And those are, that's also important because if you misuse those, it's easy to become addicted and ruin How your life. How is that? That is so crazy that they just hand these things out and it, like to a kid in high school after a surgery and then they're addicted. They're, it, it's mind blowing, but that's another podcast. Yeah. I mean, it, but it's, it's a part of the same story, which is that, you know, if it comes down to, to a really critical decision point around intention, right, which is where am I putting my human energy in any moment? Uh, and it has to do with when I put something into my body or I engage in X activity, whether it's work or uh, exercise or whatever it is, why am I doing it, right? I'm, am I doing it to escape from discomfort or am I doing it to learn more about myself and engage with my discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. And it's literally that fundamental decision process that I learned uh, through my studies of uh, working with a lot of folks struggling with addiction uh, is critical to what we get out of the experience and how we learn from the experience. When we go into it with the goal of escape from discomfort, what we ultimately all learn is that there is no escape. You, you always come back to yourself at the end. Mm -hmm. So you can't really escape. Uh, it, and then what happens, what do you do? You take more. Right, and, and the then discomfort more grows, often, and, and then, then it gets more painful. Yeah, because it's not being dealt with. Yeah. You're literally trying to avoid dealing with it by distracting yourself with something that feels good, and it and this happens with sex, and it happens with work. Alcohol, right? We've heard of workaholics, right? Alcohol, yeah, lots of drugs, yeah. right? Cell phones, video games, it gambling. It happens with all of these things. So it's mm -hmm. not unique to drugs. Um, but what's interesting is that psychedelic medicines in general have a very low addiction profile. So it's relatively challenging to, there are people who get addicted to them, but it's relatively rare compared to things like mm -hmm. opiates or cocaine or alcohol or nicotine. Um, but they have this ability to help you s steer and guide this intention. And so when we prepare people, we really, really prepare people for this idea of you're here to face what is your discomfort and to learn to build tolerance to it. And when you learn to build tolerance to it, guess what? You get way more tolerant to discomfort, which means that things that used to make you uncomfortable don't actually bother you anymore, which is a great human skill. Yeah. It's what we used to teach kids when they were young before cell phones, right? We teach them how to self-soothe on their own mm -hmm. and they had to figure it out. Maybe they would go read a book or maybe they'd go like run around in circles in their room mm -hmm. or, you know, they do something. Maybe they do deep breathing if they figure it out on their own or play with Legos. But the point is they figure out some way to soothe themselves when they're feeling uncomfortable. What do we do now? What do a lot of people do now? They say, okay, here, take my phone, right? Or take this iPad. And so what do, the, what do kids learn? They're learning, oh, I'm uncomfortable, I'm anxious, I'm restless, I don't feel good, I need distract, to do this. Yeah. Distract, distract, distract. Then what happens when they feel uncomfortable and they don't have that tool? 
they seek anything to distract or numb themselves to that discomfort. And so it's really training people and training our brains when we, when we do that technology that you mentioned earlier that's very helpful to us in a lot of ways also has the downside of, of messing with our impulse control and our, and our uh, self-soothing strategies because it makes it too easy to distract and numb yourself. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important to use technology intentionally, just like we use medicines intentionally, not to use it to numb and distract, but to use it to accomplish a goal or to solve a problem mm-hmm. or to build community or whatever it is, right? And so that, that fine line between escape and engagement with our feelings is really what determines whether or not somebody, in large part, whether or not somebody has a uh, addiction tolerance type reaction to these tools versus a engagement and healing experience mm-hmm. as a result. This is kind of a curveball, but I know someone who kind of is addicted to ketamine kind of as a, you know. It does happen. Lots of trauma. This was this is for many, many years before mm-hmm. ketamine was, you know. Used commonly. Used commonly. Yeah. Um, and like, so for someone that has severe trauma, drug addiction her whole life, now, you know, drug of choice is ketamine, OD'd multiple times, but she's, you know, for whatever the reason, like ketamine is, you know, tolerated. Um, what would you, how would you pull her out of that addiction? Like, what's her path? (laughs) That's a, that's a good question. That's a tough one. You know, um, I do work with a lot of these folks and, you know, I think the, the first place we start is sobriety. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's get you back to feeling comfortable being in your normal sober state without anything else from the outside altering you. Um, And that's where tools like Apollo and supplements like the right kinds of supplements optimize our body's functioning that don't give you a high, but they do help reduce stress and inflammation in the body. Really good quality CBD and some non psychoactive cannabinoid products. things like adaptogenic mushrooms and tools that boost functioning of the vagus nerve system, the parasympathetic recovery system, are all really helpful to people to help them learn to be present with themselves mm-hmm. without a drug on board. And so that's where it all has to start, which is showing people that they can do it and having teaching them how to show themselves, I can exist without altering myself mm-hmm. from the outside. And then we teach them techniques that alter themselves from the inside, right? So like the, the breathing techniques, the self-touch, self-hugs, under completely underrated, consensual touch and hugs from another person. Um, there's a lot of great self-touch techniques, actually. Even things like rubbing the inside of the outside of the ear. There's a vagus nerve pathway mm. there um, that helps to calm the body relatively quickly. And so we teach people all this stuff, and then they learn how to self-soothe, right? Going back to the stuff mm-hmm. we were supposed to learn as kids, and meditation and mindfulness ultimately become part of that because when we're constantly overstimulated in modern society, too much input, mm-hmm. too loud, causes stress. Mm-hmm. And our bodies respond to that not well, right? We respond to it like, oh my God, I'm totally overwhelmed right now. I don't even know where to start to mm-hmm. deal with my problems. And so um, teaching people the techniques of, of uh, learning to filter out the noise in whatever way you do it um, ultimately culminates in learning mindfulness and meditation because that is the technique that trains your attention to be under your control again. Mm -hmm. And breath is really where it starts. Breath is a thing we always have control over pretty much no matter where we are at any given time. And so if you can remind people and teach people how to breathe properly, even just to take one breath, right? Just one conscious inhale and exhale that they were in control of and that they decided to do that in and of itself can start to shift you into a state of more calm Mm -hmm. parasympathetic recovery and that's really empowering for people because addiction is really a disorder of just not feeling in control of your life so how do you try to feel in control you put something in your body that you know you know to some extent is going to make you feel a certain way Mm -hmm. that gives you a feeling of control so now it's just restoring that back to the individual Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where we start and we don't work with medicine usually with people who are habitually using psychedelics or other medicine we try to avoid medicine and use technology and use uh non non non-psychoactive non-high inducing supplements and more mild stuff Mm -hmm. um and then gradually when they've had a long period of sobriety and they've done well we can start to consider introducing a meaningful experience with something like ketamine again but it takes it takes time a long time um 
and then you may not be able to speak on this because of the United States, and, but like PTSD and opioid addiction, um, really amazing, not only just psychological, but biological, biochemical um, results from ibogaine, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. it's, it's almost like they say, it's so gnarly to go through is what I've heard, but it's for people with severe, severe trauma and also severe chemical addiction of opiates. Mm -hmm. Like it can detox, it not only, you know, organizes their brain to a way where they wake up and they're like, wow, I don't want to touch alcohol or any of my vices again, because they just, they remember mm -hmm. their divinity and who they are. Um, but it also detoxes them of the opioid addiction without needing that. It's just, that's mind blowing to me. Can yeah. you speak to that or not really? Yeah, a bit. Okay. I mean, okay. it's, it's a really fascinating effect. I don't think we fully understand how it works. Mm -hmm. in, in the case of ibogaine, which is getting a lot of press right now, this is uh, iboga, which is the uh, traditional African plant that comes from Gabon in the Buiti culture. Uh, they have used this as a coming of age medicine. Uh, for centuries, maybe millennia. And it was recently discovered over the last, I think it was like 40 years or so, to have uh, these very powerful effects to acutely treat opioid addiction, meaning that you could have people who are taking uh, o opioids for pain or, or just because they ended up getting addicted to them for whatever reason, and they're, they've been taking them for years. And normally the detox process from that is very unpleasant. I mean, a lot of people say it feels like they're dying when they're detoxing mm -hmm. from the withdrawal. And that's why it's so hard to stop. And so uh, ibogaine is a very interesting plant medicine because, uh, or, the, or the molecule ibogaine that comes from iboga is a, is a fascinating plant medicine because it has a way of almost resetting the functioning of the opioid receptor back to a more balanced state so that when people finish their 24 it's a 24-hour experience Oof. basically yes it's one of the longest psychedelic experiences and when people finish that experience they have already gone through the withdrawal process basically and the receptors mm -hmm. resensitized itself to a more even more similar sensitive sensitivity level to the way it was before they started using uh, this does not work with long-acting opioids so fentanyl doesn't work mm -hmm. because by the time they finish their ibogaine experience then they're back with fentanyl on board again because it's so long acting. Oh wow! So that's a real problem. Oh, the long acting wow. opioids are a real problem. Um, but what's interesting is ibogaine is not the only plant medicine that's helpful for this. Uh, cannabis is actually an extremely helpful plant medicine for both chronic pain, opioid use disorder, and helping people taper off of opioids, uh, and for PTSD. And we've seen that for 40 or 50 years. People have been using it in the wild growing their own, using it in the state of California, right, through the Medical Exemption Act. And um, and we've seen that when, we just actually published a paper on this because we don't have a lot of good non-opioid tools to treat opioid use disorder, but the, uh, but the um, CDC just a couple of years ago came out with a call to action to, to, for anything that's not opioid okay. that could help. And we're like, well, why are you guys forgetting about cannabis? You know, if you look at all the data across all the states of when dispensaries opened, uh, overwhelmingly we see a dramatic decrease in the number of opioid prescriptions written and filled. And we see people saying that they're using less opioids when they're using cannabis pretty much across the board for PTSD and uh, pain. So why would we not consider this to be meaningful when you can't kill yourself from cannabis? Mm -hmm. I mean, like you can't overdose to the point of poisoning yourself, right? So. That is a real benefit, and it has great pain relieving and sleep benefits. So we actually just published one of the first papers in modern times, uh, which is a large consensus paper with leading physicians around the country in harm reduction journal this year, uh, in 23, basically providing the first some of the first updated guidelines for doctors in a chart. You can just post up in your office, in <laughs> any doctor's office that says, if you have chronic pain, if your patient has chronic pain, if your patient has opioid use disorder or something in between, uh, this is the protocol for how to safely prescribe cannabinoids to them. And here is a list of products that are already vetted and safe, so you don't have to worry as doctor, nurse, therapist, what ha whatever, you don't have to worry about what you're recommending to people. You can. We've already vetted these for you. Um, so that actually was really exciting because people have been picking it up. and. It, 
I think over time we're going to see more plant medicines like ibogaine and cannabis starting to radically change the way we manage and treat chronic pain and PTSD for the better. Amazing. Um, so I asked it kind of before, but the like MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, there's, you know, I know that there's a lot of research going on. What's best for what kind of conditions? Like if, if someone's just for listeners, like want to do a trial or some sort of yeah. study or whatever they're available out there, um, besides ketamine, what, you know, what's right for, for what? So it, it's a tough question because we haven't done enough studies as a culture yet to, to fully answer that question. Uh, the FDA really steers research by uh, f- focusing researchers and clinicians on what is the fastest path to approval, not what are all the different ways this medicine could work. Hmm. So psilocybin is most psilocybin and MDMA are not yet legal for use by doctors like me. They have to be used only in trials right now. But uh, psilocybin seems to be most effective for depression and end of life and uh, end of life issues and MDMA seems to be most effective for PTSD but all but all of them are being explored for other indications as well Mm -hmm. Um, it just takes time to get those trials big enough and to get it through over the line the good news is that when that the way uh, drug prescription and therapy works is that when a medicine like ketamine gets approved for depression by the FDA we as doctors can use it off-label legally which means that if there's some evidence published or you know, some clinicians even anecdotally have said, we've seen our patients with PTSD get better, then we can legally use ketamine for PTSD even though it's FDA cleared for depression. Got it. So the first, in, so, so what are they good for? They're probably all good for multiple different illnesses mm-hmm. because they focus on helping us develop and train, retrain awareness of trauma uh, uh, that's happened to us and how to process it and remake meaning around it and how to get that feeling of kind of like you described earlier like this feeling of joy and calm clear blissful states in your body that you might not have felt in a really long time Mm -hmm. and those can be healing for lots of different people not just people who have the illnesses we're talking about right now it's so funny i i don't know why i'm bringing this up but i feel compelled so i'm just following it let's do Um, it (laughs) I remember when my brother met his now wife and I talked to him on the phone and he was describing um, his wife and how they were speaking all night for four to six hours and just like, the you know, I'm so connected to my brother. The feeling through the phone was just like, oh my God, this guy's like floating three inches off the floor. <laughs> his heart's expanded. Like he literally feels, he's, he's without any exogenous substance except for love, feels how I feel when I've done like ecstasy or MDMA. Mm-hmm. And so my thought then goes to that's how, like we are, source is love, like mm-hmm. loving intelligence of the universe. When everybody describes an NDAE, like a near-death experience, they describe this indescribable love and expansive all-knowing mm-hmm. oneness. And so like, obviously we can get those states without um, helpers. Yeah, without substances. <laughs> without substances. Yeah. Um, but like, what is you, you know, but also we're supposed to feel those things, you know? Mm-hmm. So what, like, what's your goal? What's your end game with your own personal journey with these medicines and like consciousness and like, what's, I know, um, or I guess like give, what's some profound insights that you've gained on a journey that changed your life or as a mantra now or something? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, you brought it up earlier, which is that this, this word that you used a couple times, divinity, right? And I think that when one of the most powerful experiences that any human can have, especially if you were a human who was brought up at a time where you were taught that maybe there's something wrong with you or maybe you as you are is not accepted by the people around you, your community, you need to change yourself to be accepted, which is probably most of us in the Western world at some point. If you've ever been bullied in school, right? We've had these things happen or picked on. And so it it changes the way we see ourselves from when we're born, which is, you know, we are we are born divine, right? We're born pure. And then if we see ourselves or are taught to see ourselves as wrong, bad, 
evil, right? Insert X negative word, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Unworthy of love. Then we actually start acting that out in our lives. And so I think one of the most powerful experiences that people get from psychedelic states, whether they're induced through genuine human connection and love and, and openness and conversation or hugs, or whether they're, you know, facilitated by a medicine is this remembering that I am inherently divine Mm. and that when I honor myself and I honor my intuition and learn to actually listen to myself, my intuition, that uh, I nurture that divinity. And that doesn't have to be a divinity like religious divinity where we all, you know, you subscribe to the Christian God or the Muslim God or the or the Hindu gods or whatever it is, it's it's a personal divinity, right? It's my connection. Mm-hmm. What is my connection to source or spirit or whatever X word we want to use to describe what is going on that's greater than us in the universe, mm-hmm. right? And that, I think, is the one thing that organized religion really misses and why a lot of people who spend their lives studying organized religion sometimes feel empty because it we miss out on the fact that we are part of it. We're like the essential part of it and so when you once you have that realization in the right and you have the environment set up so that you can have that realization with drugs on board or not you are you know it it it, few things could be more powerful than recognizing that you have your own connection to everything else that's personal to you and the more you nurture it the more you practice it the more you train it like a muscle it gets stronger Mm -hmm. and better and more effective and easier to access and I think for me, in with all of the trainings and all the work that I've done with my patients and and you know, just all of my, you know, all the therapy work that we've done in our lives, right? This all of it has culminated in that recognition. And and when we and, and that recognition I think is really what we inspire or aspire to as as clinicians to really, you know, invoke and invite in in all of our clients. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And like my my last, just to like end on it, because, <clears throat> you know, just in the brain, like the physical brain and then like neurochemically, is there, you know, with these bursts, is there then a recession? Like is, is there something, is there a negative impact on our brain? It, should we do, have you guys figured that out? So it's like, <laughs> that's why you should only do a series of 10 and then take a break. Like, yeah. To let your brain recover and rebalance chemically or talk to Yeah, you. yeah, definitely. I mean, ultimately the goal is that we're able to restore balance and then maintain it naturally, right? So um, if you if you're coming into the office out of out of whack, out of balance, and then we restore your balance, but we leave you feeling like you require some kind of medication or outside assistant to maintain that balance for you long term, then we haven't done our full job. And so, yes, you can absolutely take too much of everything, right? The dose makes the poison, as they say. So, you know, dosing is critical. Um, Frequency of dosing is critical. The environment of the dosing is critical. And, you know, I think what what we're seeing is having fewer, more meaningful, impactful experiences done right is much better than having more experiences that are more frequent that are not done to the Mm -hmm. full extent of rigor and and best practice Mm -hmm. and so you know to that to that end i think the main point is you know anybody who's listening to this shouldn't go rush into this thinking that psychedelic medicine is going to heal everything that they've ever wanted to heal um it's just one doorway to this to the room of healing and there's so many other doors Mm -hmm. to this room right and the more we can figure out how to unlock those doors without drugs without assistance from the outside the better off we are and needing assistance from the outside isn't bad it's okay to ask for help we should all ask for help mm-hmm. we need help but we shouldn't build reliance or dependence on that help mm-hmm. and so the the medicines really are like these incredible tools in our toolbox that we can start to use whether they're SSRIs or whether they're psychedelics or whether they're technology, wearables, supplements, right? They all have different benefits used in different ways. And um, some of them used long-term actually work better like CBD, mm-hmm. uh, like adaptogenic mushrooms, like ashwagandha, right? You need those to build up in your system taken daily for three months usually to see an effect. 
uh, for a lot of people. Oh, and, noted. That's y- good. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> and, and then there are other medicines that you absolutely do not want to take every day, like opiates. You want to, you know, at most it's like three to six days and then you stop mm-hmm. because they're for treating acute pain and we find something else to treat your pain if you still are in pain after six days. Yeah. Right. And with psychedelics, it's, you know, MDMAs, three doses over 12 weeks. And then you take a nice long break. Ketamines, uh, you know, between four and 12 doses over 20 weeks. And then you take a really nice long break. Um, and that break is an op, a really great time to gain perspective on all the work you were just doing and how different you might feel now compared to the way you felt before you started. Yeah. And all those moments of insight just help to, you know, reflecting on those just help to compound and sustain the healing process. Yeah. And even as you're talking, it's like, as you start to feel better in any modality of healing, you seek less of that need to seek right you know what i mean then you're just like to chase the dragon oh now i'm feeling good and so you don't need to yeah exactly so it kind of resolves itself and for for a period and then you integrate and then maybe another layer reveals itself yeah a couple years from now or you're going through a hard time and you need to know thyself again Mm -hmm. um so before we wrap oh go ahead well i was just going to add to that point you know there's a few things that are really interesting that have come up during my clients experiences that are relatively consistent insights people get and there, there are two, two of them that I'll leave you with that are really remind me of what you, uh, you just reminded me of, one of which is I have everything I need right now, right? So if we can remember, hey, I, I have everything I need right now, right here, I just need to find it mm-hmm. or figure out how to use it, then we spend less time seeking from the outside, right? I love that. And then we feel more full because we know we have it in here somewhere. We just need to find it and figure out how to use it. Um, and that's a big part of what we teach people that really, really helps. And that oftentimes with psychedelic medicine used in the right way, people actually, the best situation is they self-discover that insight, right? And they're like, oh, I figured this out. I discovered this, um, which they did. And that's the best way to do it, um, the best way to have that experience. And then the other thing that's really, really common insight is as hard as things may be or may seem right now, everything is as it should be, right? Because even if things are unpleasant or hard, we can't change what is. We can only change what will be. Mm -hmm. And if we spend all of our energy resisting or denying what is, then we don't have energy, any energy left to actually change what will be, Mm -hmm. right? So the, so Carl Rogers, a very famous psychotherapist, um, once said something to the effect of the only way for us to fully embrace and manifest change in our lives and healing is to first accept where we are right now Mm -hmm. walking into this room yeah right and so it's this idea of you know what am i doing with my time am i spending my time and resources protesting what is even though what is is or am i spending my time thinking learning from the way things are and understanding it and accepting it so that i can figure out how to make and get what I actually want out of the world Mm -hmm. and out of my life and experience. Yeah, totally. And stress is resistance. Mm -hmm. And so to get out of that stress, the first step is to accept. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest part, but it's acceptance. And dropping the resistance. And I had heard you say that before, I think, with Aubrey Marcus maybe, but, you you know, everything is as as it should be. So you know, just different time. I, I prepare kind of fluidly for podcasts. And sometimes I'm like, I read the book, I underline, I have specific questions. And then I'm like, listen to a few podcasts, get your gist. And I'm like, oh my God, I have so many just questions. I don't, I'm not organized. I've got, I've been catching up and I'm just like at a point where I'm like, everything is as it should be. I can't resist the prep I did or didn't do. Um, or how it looked different from another interview, mm-hmm. or how I had a super stressful week, whatever the circumstances that leads up. And it's just like whatever version of that. And it's the beautiful thing is when you when you have that embodied experience on a journey, it really lands for you. But then mm-hmm. clinically, when you have multiple people reporting that they have that experience, it's like at some point you have to like believe it's true. Yeah. And then you also just logically go, I can't change the past. I, I'm in resistance and stress, or I could choose to say, oh, I prepared exactly how I should have prepared. Everything mm-hmm. is as it should be. You know, someone's 20 minutes late. The guy cut me off. And it just it allows you, like, to just be, mm-hmm. you know? And it's such a much 
better. I can't do it all the time if right. I'm like unresourced and oh, easily yeah. triggered. Like I easy. lose my shit. But yeah. like it is a beautiful. Again, the more we can embody that, and the more um, we can have that mantra, it's like we just give our and it's that judgment of ourselves. Mm-hmm. That things should be different. That right? things I should, should be different. different. I should, should be, different. be different. I should have done something different. I should right. not have done this. Right. It's like this shouldn't have happened. <sighs> exactly. You know? That's a slippery slope. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It pulls a, us out of the present. Yep. So everything is as it should be, guys. <laughs> Real quick, Apollo Neuro. Tell me about it because I'm so excited to try mine. Thank you. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, so Apollo is actually a tool and a technology that came out of my research at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center when we were working with veterans with severe PTSD, and we were trying to figure out, seeing these profound results in the psychedelic research trials. We, you know, we saw people actually getting better long term, and we've never seen that with any mental health treatment in the history of psychiatry that you could give just three to 12 doses of medicine over an extended period and people get better long term and they don't need more medicine. That doesn't happen. And so as I started to see the same people I was treating by the regular Western model in my office, you know, that were getting better with MDMA and not with everything that I was taught to do. I said, you know, well, I have to learn how to do this. So in 2016, I I got trained uh, with a few of my colleagues in MDMA assisted therapy, and then subsequently ketamine assisted therapy. And what I learned from those trainings was, especially from the MDMA training, that MDMA seems to be working by molecularly amplifying the safe the safety mm-hmm. in our brains that is brought into the therapeutic setting by the therapist and, and the trusting bond between the therapist and the, and the patient then creates a sense of safety. Like, I trust you, you're not judging me. I can talk to you about whatever I need to talk to you about. And the medicine just builds on that tremendously mm-hmm. and molecularly amplifies those same circuitry, it seems. And so all of this seemed to point to safety and that's, that safety, emotional, mental, physical, feeling safe in our own bodies was critical to allowing the healing process to f- unfold on its own and uh, or even to just start and as we started to explore safety we thought well maybe it's possible if safety is the key because trauma is really fear mm-hmm. which is the opposite of safety uh, it's learned fear so if safety seems to be really important to people actually getting better then we should be able to replicate that effect without a drug because there's lots of things that make us feel safe right soothing touch soothing music taking a deep breath where you feel in control of your body, um, intentional listening, hugs, eye-to-eye contact, right? All of these things help us almost instantaneously feel safe. And they're therapeutic. They, they will even work for people who are severely mentally ill. Mm. Um, and so we thought, well, what can people take on the go anywhere they are, out of the office, in the office, with their kids, at work, at school? Well, they can take a wearable, and if we could make a wearable that delivers soothing touch to the body with vibration, gentle vibration, delivered in the right way, perhaps we could reactivate that safety pathway and retrain ourselves to learn how to be more regulated, be more present, uh, be more meditative and mindful on the go. And so this started in 2014, and we started researching this technology, and then I got my MDMA training, and that really solidified this safety pathway. And then we mapped out the entire nervous system, safety nervous system, to try to figure out what are all the inputs that can give a similar experience to MDMA. And then touch became the one that rose to the surface because touch is instantaneous. It requires no effort on the person receiving it. And it it just rapidly increases vagal tone that helps people feel safe. And as we started to pull on those threads, we realized that this was something we could absolutely make wearable. And so we did a couple double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trials at the University of Pittsburgh that were overwhelmingly positive, showing we could boost, uh, this was in healthy folks, showing we could boost cognitive performance under stress, heart rate variability. It's the first time that we that anyone has ever shown you can improve heart rate variability, which is a measure of vagal tone, mm. parasympathetic recovery, nervous system activity, with just wearing a device, not doing anything. Um, and it improved athletic recovery. And as we started to see that, then we started testing it in the real world with vets with PTSD and kids with autism and people with anxiety, depression, et cetera. And we started seeing the same results as we saw in the lab, but better. These people were 
recovering. And nothing was more exciting to us to actually see people get better who were typically of our patient population that don't get better mm. and don't respond. Uh, and so while we continued down the FDA trials, uh, we saw so many healthy people, including ourselves and our friends and family, benefiting from the Apollo technology and the vibration in the wearable that we decided to release it as a wellness product to consumer market so that anybody could access this technology because we felt it was basically a right for people to feel good. Mm. And if people and the people deserve to feel good, so we're going to create tools that are safe and effective at making that better and more accessible for people that don't have side effects and that anybody can wear. Child, adult, elderly person, pregnant woman, anybody can wear this thing. And it just feels like a cat purring on your body that you can wow. take with you anywhere you go. So do you have the tantrum version? I can just like strap around the toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> no. We do have we do have one with a strap okay. and a clip. You can, okay. it works anywhere on your body. Okay. So people use it on their pets. They use it on their, oh, on wow. their children. That's amazing. Um, it has no screen, so a lot of parents will program it so that it turns on. There's different vibes or different energy states. So okay. they'll they'll program it for focus for when their kids are in school and class. And they'll program it to wind their kids down at, at night and wow. to wake them up in the morning. So it regulates their entire circadian cycle, sleep and wake cycles. Oh my gosh. By just gently nudging your energy up and down throughout the day. It's kind of like having a soundtrack following you around with your favorite music, kind of adjusting to your mood. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but you don't need your ears because it works through your body. That's brilliant. I love it. That's so cool. I cannot. Thank you. I'm I excited for you to try. Yeah, me too. Um, well, where can people find you? Because this is also, and I mean, that Apollo sounds amazing. Oh yeah, I know you'll really enjoy it, uh, especially <laughs> with all the things we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so any, I would love to hear from you. Come find me on my website at drdave.io. Um, and you can also come find me on socials at Dr. David Rabin on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and if you want to find Apollo Neuro, you can go to wearablehugs.com, which is what the kids call it. Uh, or you can, if you have an iPhone, I would highly recommend that you just go to the app store and download the Apollo Neuro app because we just released a demo for the iPhone where anybody with an iPhone or iPad can experience Apollo right here and now on your phone. Oh, cool. Um, and that'll give you the real experience of what it feels like to have the wearable with just one vibe. The wearable has about 10 vibes and all the automation features, but um, the phone will give you a really nice taste. So cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. It's my pleasure. And having this conversation was enlightening, and now I want to try everything. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks thank so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. And make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And please, rate and review us so that we can grow and reach more people. Thanks so much, and be well. Be well.